First of all, I want to acknowledge that we are the uh, ancestral and ancestral territories of the Musqueam uh, uh, First Nations. Uh, so we thank them for uh, allowing them uh, us to do research and present it here. So I know Thomas for quite a long time we have been collaborating for quite a long time uh, on different aspects about particularly looking at uh, climate change and how that affects species. Uh, uh, Thomas is a climate scientist and uh, oceanographer. And so he actually is the guy who we go to when we actually need uh, oceanographic information, we have all the latest theories and projections about climate change affecting the ocean. And then we bring in our biology aside, and then it's a really good collaboration that we actually were, have been really productive in generating a lot of new research and ideas. And it's continuing, and, uh, and, and so we are really happy to continue the collaboration here. Thomas uh, did his uh, P PhD in Bern, uh, University of Bern, uh, and then after that, he moved to the US, to Princeton. Um, to work at a uh, postdoctoral research fellow there with Jorge Samiento, and after that he moved back to Switzerland, uh, this time uh, to uh, Zurich. So he uh, was a research fellow in um, the uh, ETH Zurich, and uh, after that, uh, in 2017, he got a uh, faculty position uh, back in his uh, home university in uh, in Lausanne, where he is currently right now. So uh, he has been like uh, one of the lead researchers internationally in looking at marine heat wave and extreme events. Uh, we actually work uh, as uh, both as uh, um, authors in the um, upcoming special report for the ocean and quiet spheres of the IPCC report, and um, Thomas is leading on the chap uh, is lead authors on the chapter that include heat wave extreme event in it. So okay, okay, so the work I'm going to present to you is. Um, Mainly done in collaboration with Sandra Striegel and Friedrich Vogel, two PhD students in my group, Charlotte Laufkötter, who was a postdoc, and then also colleagues from, from ETH, Eric Fischer and Nicky Kuhn. So I'm going to talk about the marine heat waves and what we know about these heat waves and how they're going to change on the future of the warming and what might be the impacts of these uh, anomalous sea surface temperatures on, on marine ecosystems, but also on social economic systems. Okay, so let's start first with just the broad overview why the ocean is important. So it's, it has taken up over the last 10 years about 23% of the anthropogenic carbon, which we have emitted as humans <coughs> in the atmosphere. 50% roughly stays in the atmosphere and about 30% is taken up by the terrestrial biosphere. So in terms of heat uptake, it's actually a, even a, a, a more important player because it actually takes up 93% of the excess energy which has been accumulated in the, in the Earth system due to the increase in greenhouse gases. And only 3% goes into the melting of the ice, and 3% warming up the, the soils and so on, and only 1% actually of the excess energy stays in the atmosphere. So it actually moderates climate change in the ocean by taking up anthropogenic carbon and excess heat, but that comes at the cost of profound alteration in, in its physical, but also in the biogeochemical state. So the uptake of excess energy obviously leads to a warming of the ocean. And here you see on the left side surface warming of the, actually the atmosphere of sitting above the ocean. And you see that almost everywhere the ocean has actually warmed up, except for example in the North Atlantic, where we know for good reason why that actually happens. And also in the Southern Ocean, which is not yet covered yet in this figure actually, the sea surface temperatures have not really warmed up because of the ocean circulation which brings up the cold water there to the surface. And so when we look at ocean heat content change on the right side, you can see that actually the, the ocean has warmed up down to 2,000 meters. So the red one shows you the, the red uh, line shows you uh, the ocean heat content changes uh, averaged over or integrated from 700 to 2,000 meter. The blue one from 0 to 700 meter and the yellow line the whole integrated ocean ecocontent changes. So the ocean has taken up about 110 million terawatt hours over the last 50 years. And that's actually quite a lot. So a, a typical nuclear power plant in Switzerland produces 8 terawatt hours per year. And that actually is 110 million terawatt hours. So just 
So actually the ocean is warming up, but just to give you an update, so you may have recently seen, or yesterday, or even this morning, that there was some discussion about recent estimates of ocean heat uptake. It was in the New York Times, not this morning. This morning? In the New York Times. The New York Times, okay. So I think they were relating to one of these. So there were a couple of papers which have been published recently about the estimates of the ocean heat uptake over the last 50, 50 years. And actually, why is it so interesting is because the AR5, the IPCC assessment report published five years ago, they saw a mismatch between, um, between what we measure actually in the ocean in terms of heat uptake and what the models actually show. So the models actually show a stronger warming of the ocean or have shown than what has been actually measured actually in the ocean. But now, Somehow these ocean heat uptake estimates have been revised, the, the, the observational base. And what you see is actually they now align much more with what the models actually show. So, so there are three different estimates here from Dominguez, Ishii, and Chang, which are all based on, on, on in situ measurements of temperature in the ocean, but also on Argo flow data. And they also show, so these are the robots which take the measurements in the ocean. And they use novel techniques to actually fill in the gaps which are still there where we don't really have measurements. And now they actually align much better with the models. And there is also another estimate based on you know, oxygen and CO2 levels, very trace gas measurements. So because the oxygen is losing, uh, the ocean is losing oxygen, and also the solubility of CO2 decreases with warming waters, actually you can measure these changes in oxygen and CO2 in the atmosphere, and then you can infer the heat uptake of the ocean of the People have done that, so Ralph Keeling and colleagues also from Princeton. But they somehow also aligned, although there was a big discussion about the, the statistics they did in their paper, which was published two months ago in Nature, but still they somehow also aligned here. So these are indirect measurements of ocean heat uptake based on oxygen and CO2 data. So overall, the ocean is still warming up, but probably a bit more than we previously thought, based on the you know, newest observation-based tests. Okay. Um, and also, the coasts are obviously warming up, but probably not as homogeneous as we would think. So, for example, the Humboldt current system, the large money ecosystem here, it's, it's all, didn't really warm up. But overall, also the coastal regions are actually warming. Quite strongly. So, what about other drivers? So, ecosystem drivers, because of the uptake of anthropogenic carbon, also the pH is decreasing, and here is the observational based estimates, and then these are model projections for the future um, for different emission, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. And you see for the high emission scenario, the pH is actually projected to increase quite a lot, by about 0.3 units, 0.4 units, but for the low emission, two degree kind of uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario, it actually increase the data. And because the ocean is warming up, it also stratifies the upper ocean, so the density is decreasing, and that decreases the mixing of the surface ocean with the deeper ocean, and therefore that also decreases the supply of oxygen from the surface, because the oxygen is actually there. We have a lot of oxygen in the surface ocean because it's equilibrated with the atmosphere. And if the ocean is actually more and more stratified, that actually the, that the supply of oxygen into the ocean is reduced, but also the solubility is reduced with warm water. And that's why actually we expect also a decrease in oxygen on the future climate change as we go more. And because of the stratification and we have a lot of nutrients in the deeper ocean, the resupply of these nutrients to the upper ocean is also reduced, and that's what the models show is actually <coughs> net primary production. So the phytoplankton growth and so on is actually also projected to decrease with future climate change, mostly because of, um, of a decrease in the nutrient supply. So we can somehow, um, we can somehow um, uh, summarize the oceans warming up, turning south, losing breath possibly starving for food in the, in the future. And 
that's often called the quadruple bony for ocean life. So we have kind of four stresses. And, um, and that's also why the last IPCC report came on with this uh, burning amber diagram. And they say, OK, so the more global warming we have, the more risk the marine ecosystem will face on these certain global warming levels. So if you have a, a purple color here, the ecosystems will face high, very high risk. If you have a red one, it will face high risk of shipping and so on. So it already starts at it already started the increase in But now what they also have shown is that actually extreme weather events will become more frequent in the future. They were mostly focusing on, on terrestrial-based heat waves or drought events or flooding events, so in the atmosphere. And um, so how can we understand that? So if you have, a, so let's say, a sea surface temperature, um, PDF here, frequency distribution, we usually define the extremes here in the tails of the distribution. And uh, so if you have just a, a, a mean shift, in this distribution, so let's say a warming, we have an overproportional increase in the extreme. So we have more hot extremes. It's pretty obvious. So without actually changing the higher moments of the frequency distribution, such as cumulus or the variability itself, just by changing the mean, we would expect an overproportional increase in the extremes. So, but uh, up to I would say like three or four years, we didn't really know how ocean extreme events actually change in the future global warming. Even though there was a special report on extremes in 2012, there was only one page out of 500 that say who were dealing with ocean extremes. And they were dealing with waves at the coast and how these uh, waves will become more extremes or not extreme, and how that impacts coastal systems. There were, were no mentioning about the extremes that, uh, in the ocean per se in hydrochemistry or the physics. So the leading hypothesis is that actually when we include, include these extreme ocean events in our risk assessment, for example for marine uh, organisms or ecosystems, that they will probably face much higher risks than we previously saw. Why is that? And I, I take an analogy from the from the DC meeting from Steve Whittycomb, who was actually showing this exactly this picture. And what he said is, okay, so if you are an organism, the thing that really hits you is the weather. So it's the rocky you know, in front of you who hits you strongly. <laughs> so he's delivering actually the knockout. And behind him is the climate. So that's the trainer, making him big and making him strong, <laughs> making him even really hot. <laughs> So this is actually, so that's kind of the climate change here. So that's, and here we have the weather events which probably can knock off some systems on top of this climate change. And I somehow like that. And so we actually have observed some heat waves, marine heat waves, over the last few years, which had some impacts on ecosystems. And the most prominent ones were, were the Western Australia Marine Heat in 2011, off the coast of, of Australia, then the Northwest Atlantic 2012 Marine Heat Wave, and also the Northeast Pacific uh, sea surface temperature anomaly in 2013-2015 called the Blob, which you may have heard. Yes. And uh, but not only these three uh, heat waves have occurred; they were actually in all ocean basins. There were heat waves which have, had, which have caused the documented impacts, you know, and which has also been written up in peer reviewed literature. So for example, we had one in the Yellow Sea, we had several in the Coral Sea, which you may have heard. We also had one in the coastal Peruvian system, and the Tasmania Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea, and so on. So, what are causing these heat waves. So what are the processes which can lead to such, such uh, sea surface temperature anomalies? And uh, actually people have, have looked at that for quite a long time, what, what drives sea surface temperature anomalies uh, in the ocean, and you can actually make a mixed layer heat budget and then look at the different processes. So for example, enhanced air-sea heat flux can drive a heat wave, 
or attraction and diffusion processes, or entrainment of cold water to the, to the mix layer can probably knock out the heat wave or actually stop it. But overall, when we look at it, so El Nino events usually set the global mean sea surface temperature to higher levels, and that's usually the most important player to actually set the stage to actually then that these new non heat waves can actually develop. But also atmospheric perturbations such as stable anomalous weather conditions. So for example, during the block there was a really stable high pressure system over the Northeast Pacific, which have caused reduced heat loss from the from the ocean to the atmosphere and then actually caused this heat loss. But also anomalous surface wind stress uh, and so on, all these processes can lead to changes in sea surface temperatures. But also heat waves over land can lead to, to, to um, heat waves over the ocean through enhanced air sea heat exchange. And of course also we have the ocean weather, so turbulence and mesoscale processes and eddies which can lead to anomalous sea surface temperatures. So please just ask me if you have any questions. Okay, so what were the impacts? And you are you probably much more an expert on that than I am. But these are the documented impacts. So the coral sea, we know that high sea surface temperatures can lead to coral bleaching. And but what we have what I found quite interesting, so that for example the Western Australia Marine Heat Wave in 2011 actually leads to or led to an entire regime shift of the ecosystem structure. So it was dominated by these kelp forests before the heat wave was hit and actually was replaced by this big ecosystem and totally different uh, diversity of organisms after that. And it, it hasn't been replaced or recovered since 2011. So it's now seven years since then that the ecosystem still looks like that. Yes. How long did that one last? That was 10 weeks. Oh my God. Okay. Yes. So that was actually, so what you have is actually here you have this uh, warm current, the Luby current, which goes down here. And actually, because of the La Nina condition, it was pushed further down, of south. And that led to this anomalous sea surface temperature there, which lasted 10, 10 minutes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we had others and other impacts. So the Northwest Atlantic Marine Heat Wave led to anomalous sea surface temperatures early in the, uh, in the season. And that led then that the lobsters were actually going to the coast much earlier than people were used to, and that actually led then to a price collapse in the, in the lobster fisheries, yeah. and also then to an economic impact. So the, it can also have economic impacts to these ecosystem changes, which you know probably much more than I do. And then the blob had a wide range of impacts from lower tropic <coughs> organisms to higher tropic organisms, but there are always losers and winners probably more losers, sometimes more winners than other times, but there are always losers as we see the And these heat waves can also, that's why I was actually at the Metrology Field Society meeting this week, these heat waves can also change weather patterns uh, in the atmosphere because they, they can change the, the, the dynamics in the atmosphere. And for example, this coastal Peruvian heat wave actually caused mm -hmm. Uh, heavy rainfall in Peru, and then which caused them flooding. I live in Europe, I feel that, but I've never seen such a big woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's his wrong. <laughs> 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 Interesting. <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should probably more focus on like this. <laughs> Yeah, they're actually a group of, so 
So Alistair Bobdale's group in Australia, they just came up with a new classification system for heat waves. Yeah, and in the same way as you do for hurricanes. So you have like the category one, or two, or three, or four heat wave, which somehow is probably easier for people who are not understanding the science behind it to understand what that means, what could mean for the ecosystem. Yeah, so people are developing these classification schemes. That's the mechanics. We cannot be It's very really like a accepted. I love this. Or yeah. they just fly, I mean, it just got published. I'm not sure how this was received then, from, for example, from, from HS or from policy makers or whoever in the system. Reading. The classification of uh, Alistair is based on weak or amplitude or weak and amplitude of the wave. But it's actually the amplitude above a certain threshold. So it's the amplitude rather than the, the duration. Not how long it takes. Right. It's both. It's both. It's like, I think it's a, they based it on the degree heating weeks for four weeks, right? Yeah. So basically they, they just measure how long after, like how long and how much over the mean temperature is for that place. And what they also took into account if you have a place where you have more variability, you need to have a, a, a bigger amplitude than in a place where you have small variability, where already a small yeah. excursion from the, yeah. from, from let's say the 99 percent and really matters. Right. Mm -hmm. So they, they scaled it with the variability the system is usually used to. Yeah. So I think, yeah, why not? I mean, I personally don't think that it's, I, I somehow like the idea. It's, it's somehow it's easier to understand to non-specialists. I mean, you could also potentially get to a point where, as hurricanes, you could somehow project whether or not you're going to have a very intense heat wave this year or a minor intensity. Prepare for that, you think? Well, for that, you would need to have good predictions for yeah. the season I mean, temperatures. In a, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So oh, okay, now let's let's talk about uh, how these heat waves are actually going to change on the, on the future global warming. And that was published a few months ago. Um, so what we did is we looked at daily sea surface temperature data. Uh, we used the Reynolds SST with a quarter degree horizontal resolution, and started from 1982 with daily uh, output, and we combined that with the 12 fully coupled CB5 versus model where we used uh, 12 models, pre-industrial control simulations, and then also historical, and also two future greenhouse gas emission scenarios, a high and a low one. And we used daily output of these models. And they are using <coughs> one degree resolution, so it's rather coarse. So we need to focus on the open ocean and not on the coastal ocean when we do these exercises. And uh, so how do we usually define a heat wave? And Alistair Hoptes and their colleagues already came up with a qualitative uh, description. So marine heat waves are characterized by ocean temperatures that are extremely warm for days to months, can extend up to thousands of kilometers, and can penetrate multiple hundreds of meters into the deep ocean. Okay, so how did we define the, the heat wave in our study? So here we used actually a relative threshold of the 99th percentile, and if the temperature goes above the threshold, we call it a heat wave. So you can see that on the left side. And then we, 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 we took or we, we calculated different matrices, like the probability ratio, so how frequent is, uh, these heat waves occur, the spatial extent, how big they are, the maximum intensity, the duration, how long they last, but also the cumulative mean intensity. So that's kind of the mean intensity times the duration, similar to the degree heating rate. And what we did is we focused mainly on summertime marine heat waves. We didn't really desystemize the data, so we only took the, we focused mostly on the hottest days of the years, and we calculated then annual statistics of these models. So basically, we looked how probable heat wave will occur in, in future climate change, or also over the, over the historical period. And if we look at the satellite data from 1982 to today, and that's the probability ratio. 
So you can see that actually over the observational period we already see a doubling of these heat waves. Um, so an increase in the probability ratio of 0.1, which is consistent with another study by Ray Oliver, which has been published in Nature Communications. And if we look at the, uh, the changes in annual mean sea surface temperature, you see that it's actually quite strongly correlated. When mm -hmm. we have high global mean SST, we also have higher um, uh, probabilities of morning. And if we look at these uh, of the models, actually, the models actually capture the trends quite well. So, of course, they have a different variability because they generate their own variability, so they are not forced by the real weather, they have their own variability. But overall, the trend is quite similar. It's two, the probability of and then for other matrices, you can also see similar things for the intensity on the left side has increased, and then also the, the spatial extent has already increased by 66% over the last uh, 37 years. And the same action here for the models, they also capture these trends quite well. Okay. So when we look then at the spatial pattern, we see on the left side the trend in these probability ratios and on the right side the, the trend in sea surface temperatures. And you can see when the, actually the temperature is elevated, we also have a higher probability that these heat waves will occur, which is kind of obvious. But over the last 35 years, actually, the eastern equatorial Pacific has it's rather cooled and also the southern ocean has had, didn't really warm up. That's also why these heat waves didn't really uh, change that much. Okay. okay. So now the question is, are the observed trends actually caused by natural variability or is that already an anthropogenic trend? And to test that, what you do in climate science, usually you take the control simulations which have no anthropogenic trends in them. And then you can calculate here 35 year trends for all these control simulations in sea surface temperature. So we get then more than 6,000 trends. And you can then uh, calculate the PDF or show the PDF of these trends and in the control simulation. And we then said if the trend is above the 99th percentile observed over the satellite period, it is actually detectable. So that's how, so that's kind of IPCC standard how you do these detection and attribution approaches. And when we look at the satellite period, yes, we see that actually over the satellite period, this trend is detectable. And because the temperature change over the satellite period is most likely due to anthropogenic climate change, we can also attribute this trend to human cultural And that the same applies actually for, for the models. So they also show that. So it's rather consistent between the observations and the models. So it's highly unlikely that the trends what we see over the satellite periods are caused by natural variability. It's highly likely that they are caused by natural climate change. Okay, so that's kind of the, the same. And then we can do the same, um, same um, exercise for the annual intensity on the left side, which is less clear. And for the, for the spatial extent, and you see again, well, okay, for the satellite, they are all above the 99th percentile. So, over the trends in the annual intensity and the spatial extent, they are detectable. It can be then attributed to global. And then you can do the same exercise for these individual events. You can actually attribute the likelihood that this event has occurred if actually the probability has increased due to global warming. And you can do this exercise for all these, uh, these marine heat waves which have, uh, have been uh, documented in the peer-reviewed literature. And you can see that actually, so if it's more red to, 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 red to, to brownish, then it means actually the, the probability has, has increased due to global warming. If it's more yellowish, the probability has only a little bit increased to the problem. And you can see that these heat waves, the probability has, yeah, has quite largely increased to, to global warming for all them, for intensity and the duration. Okay. So now, maybe something 
you're also asking sometimes, are these models actually good enough to do these statistics and also to look at heat flows? And we also did that, so we looked at, at the width of the 99% you know, that I spotted here, so the width of the distribution at each grid point here on the left side for satellite access T, and on the right side, the mean of the CMIP-5 model, and you see, well, the 99% is actually quite well represented in this model. So, there's actually quite good agreement. When we look at the intensity, well, first the duration, so how long do these heat waves actually last? So here on the right side, you see the duration for CMIP-5 models. So the couple of climate models on the left side for the satellite data, you see, okay, in the models they last actually longer than in reality. And that has probably to do with the resolution of these models. So they cannot represent, for example, storms in the atmosphere, which can, if you have a storm passing by, that induces mixing and actually brings up colder water to the surface and it actually stops the heat. That is not represented in these models. And also the ocean weather, so these small scale, mesoscale eddies, for example, are also not represented in these models. That's actually, that's why these models overestimate the duration of these uh, sea surface temperature excursion. So we have to be a more cautious when we look at the duration. And then for the intensity, I would say, okay, if it goes above, how far it goes above is actually also well represented. <clears throat> and then also the spatial extent, so that's the size of a marine heat wave and the uh, PDF, and then of the sizes for the, the white is for satellite, the, the red for the models, and you see that actually in the models the size is a bit bigger than actually in reality, and that has again probably likely be related to the, to the, to the resolution of the we are now, I have a PhD now working with the tens to the degree uh, ocean model of the GFPL to look at the impact of the resolution on the representation of this heat wave. Which probably then will also have, we have a better representation of the coast. So, but the, the average size of the heat wave today is about the size of the area of Switzerland by coincidence. <laughs> and the, 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 the future size will be about the size of, of China. In terms of how these things, but I will come to that. Okay, so what about future trends? So when we look, we take these models for granted and we look how they represent changes in these heat waves, and we look at the x axis at the threshold, how we define the heat wave 99th percentile, for example, we get 3.65 days per year a heat wave. Well, that's by definition. So that's for the pre-industrial. Then for one degree, it looks like that. For 1.5 degree, it looks like this. Two degree, four degree. So, in other words, we can say at pre-industrial, a one in 100 day event will or occurs today in one, as a one in 11 day event, and on the 3.5 degree morning, it will be a one in two day event. So almost so every every second. Every other day. And of course, if we go to the very rare extreme, then the, the relative increase will be higher than for the moderate extremes because we are then in the tail of the distribution. So a 1 in 27 year event will be a 1 in 71 day event and will become a 1 in 4 day event in the future. So now, now when we plot the probability ratio, so the number of heat waves per year relative to the number of heat waves in the pre-industrial climate. So that's the increase here you see. Against global warming, you see, we see that it scales quite well with the mean global warming level. And it's independent of the pathway we actually follow in the future in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. So it doesn't really matter if we have a, we have a for RCP 2.6, like a stabilizing uh, pathway, or for RCP 8.5 more an exponential global warming pathway. It's scales, it's quite path independent. And because it scales so well with global warming, 
we can actually up to we can actually say it also the scales collide well with cumulative carbon emissions because the global warming against the cumulative carbon emissions so this TCRE concept there's actually also a linear relationship so cumulative carbon emissions against global warming is a linear relationship <coughs> that's why we can also actually attribute the changes in the population to cumulative Yes, and that's actually also, yeah, that's actually the workshop I'm going to the next week. It's about this cumulative carbon emission. Okay, now when we look at terrestrial based heat waves, we see that the increase is actually less. When we take the same definition of a heat wave, and we only look at the grid cells over land, and we compare that with the grid cells over the ocean. We see that the actually marine heat waves will increase 60% more than terrestrial based heat waves. That's also it's actually quite a simple explanation for that. So even when we when we um, plot the PDF of the temperature over land, we see well the temperature variability over land is much higher than on the ocean. So it's water so it has a much higher heat capacity water than actually the land. So even though the ocean is actually warming up, which would lead to less increase in heat waves. We have a much higher increase of marine heat waves than terrestrial based heat waves because the width of the distribution is much narrower in the ocean than all of the land. So that's so here that's based on observations and they just applied a shift in the mean without actually changing the, the, the variability or the higher moments of the frequency. So we get many more heat waves compared to land based heat waves. Where do these heat waves actually uh, stro most strongly increase? So you here you see the probability ratio for one degree on the left side, for two degrees in the middle, and for 3.5 degrees on the right side. And you see that these patterns scale quite well with the global warming levels. So lower increases in the Southern Ocean. Uh, the highest increase is in the Western Pacific Warm Pool and in the Arctic Ocean. So in the Western Pacific Warm Pool, actually the variability is already low. And a small change in the mean temperature leads to an overproportional increase. And in the Arctic Ocean, actually, because of the retreat of the sea ice, we have a strong warming signal. And that can lead to a this overproportional increase. And in the Southern Ocean, on the transient climate warming, 21st century, the Southern Ocean doesn't really warm up that much because of the, 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 the upwelling of the cold water to the, to the surface because of the strong west winds which bring that cold water up to the surface. Okay, and then we can go a little bit into more detail. So that's for the Arctic Ocean, and we also did it for the large marine ecosystems. Although they are not really well presented in these models, but they show somehow a similar change in terms of morning heat wave changes as the global ocean. And then the southern ocean shows smaller changes. So then the white lines here are the global mean changes, and then the bars are then the, the region. Southern ocean, Western Pacific one, large marine ecosystems. Now you may already know, uh, now expect that so what drives these changes in heat wave? Is it actually changes in the variability or is it a kind of mean shift? If we tested that, so I took here the same picture as before this one for 3.5 uh, global warming level. On the left side and on the right side, we took the control simulations and added a pattern of 3.5 degree global warming to the control. So without changing the variability, so just adding the mean change. And what you can see is actually these patterns match quite well. So that means is most regions, it's just the mean change in temperature which changes the frequency of the heat waves. And it's not actually the variability of what you're looking for. Otherwise, so like an increase in storms or something like that. In these models, it's mostly the mean change in temperature which drives the changes in these heat waves. There are some exceptions in the Arctic Ocean, especially the summer sea surface temperatures are increasing quite largely, whereas in winter they are still at freezing point. And, and also in the, in the 
here in the, in the ENSO region, some models show, show uh, uh, reduced ENSO variability in the future and some higher ENSO variability. But overall, most of the changes can be explained by a simple mean shift of the distribution. And then the other matrices, here on the left side, the spatial extent change, the annual mean duration and annual mean intensity, they all increase quite heavily. And yeah, so of course, if we can limit some on global warming to a lower level than 3.5 degrees, which is actually projected for RCP 8.5, that would be beneficial in terms of uh, my life changes. Okay, so now maybe I have time for an additional five minutes. So it's a pretty simple story. It's a mean shift in the SST which can change the, 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 the matrices or the characteristics in one heat wave. But that's not necessarily the case for other variables which can drive changes in ecosystems such as ocean acidification. And that's some work which uh, is actually uh, which has just started by my uh, PhD student, Friedrich Borg, who looks at how ocean acidification extremes are altered by variability change. And because the ocean carbonate systems, you may have heard that is non-linear, so the rebel factor is non-linear related to the PCO2 increase, we expect the increase in variability in H plus. In, with increasing CO2. And that has been shown uh, for PCO2, for example, with, uh, based on the SOCAT data set. So here you see the increase in the seasonality of the last 25 years. So for different regions in the ocean. And in all these regions, actually, the seasonality in PCO2 increases with increasing CO2. And also modeling studies have now shown that actually the seasonality in H plus and PCO2 will continue into the future. So that means the seasonality in pH will be reduced because it's the minus log of H plus. But the H plus uh, variability actually increases. But pH variability probably increases. But that will have obviously then an effect on the extreme events in ocean acidification. So regardless of the mean shift, but just by increasing the H plus uh, variability, that will lead, obviously, to more extremes. And so we have looked at that, or my PhD student, in a model, without, um, not in observations, in a model, how actually this, uh, this changes in the variability will, will, will affect the extremes in the ocean. And here on the left side, you see that the days above the 99% threshold, so uh, for a RCP 4.5 scenario, so the blue line shows you the surface. He also looked at the depth, so uh, 200 meter. And that's just, that's the increase just by the, in caused by the increase in variability, and we neglected the mean shift. So we get rid of the mean shift, which, which you would also have, you would have an increase in H plus concentration, just by the increase in PCO2. But you can see that actually we see a large increase just due to the increase in the seasonality in these extremes here on the left side and also the duration, especially in the deep ocean, in the deeper ocean, actually increases <coughs> quite strongly due to the, to the increase in variability. So now my goal with my group is um, to investigate like extreme events in ocean acidification, in extreme events also in oxygen and temperature, and also look at like compound events. What are the conditions and what are the processes which can lead to actually extremes occurring at the same time and at the same place? Mostly used in models as well as observations. Okay, so to conclude, um, I tried to show you that some recent uh, observed marine heat waves uh, uh, have demonstrated the high vulnerability of marine ecosystems to such um, high sea surface temperature exposure, but also physical and socio-economic systems are, are impacted. Then marine heat waves have doubled in frequency since the, the measurements of the satellites started in 1982 with one quarter of the world's ocean experiencing either the longest or most intense events on record in the last 
with years, or into 2015 and 16. Today, about 90% of the observed heat waves are, have an anthropogenic component. And yeah, marine heat waves will actually increase in frequency, intensity, duration throughout all ocean basins for the future global warming. And um, yeah, an increase in marine heat waves will probably likely push marine organisms, fisheries, and ecosystems beyond the limits of their resilience, especially those which are not really mobile, such as coral reefs, which is something that cannot escape from the water. 